I was for sure almost late today. For sure, almost missed that seven o'clock. Mark, do I have sound today? I know I didn't have sound at the start of yesterday. Almost messed that one up bad. I was sitting here being, uh, I was eating first. First, that's what I was doing. And then I would stop paying attention because uh, I was responding to the chat and looking up some other stuff, but welcome to another day of Mastermind Academy. Happy Thursday, everyone. We're almost done with the week. I mean, we're done with this. This is the last day of this week for, for Mastermind Academy, but you're almost done with the work week. Um, well, if you work normal uh, work week days, you know, if you're a weekend worker, you've probably been off and I'm jealous of you. I used to work weekends and I loved it. But welcome tonight is Contained. We're back with Contained and Excursion into Docker, a Docker deep dive. Uh, Kicho, so I tried to, <laughs> I tried to add that little calendar thing at the bottom. I thought that I was gonna be able to add information about each day, but I could not. Um, the information about, I'm only running two excursions right now. You can find them on academy.mastermind. Um, I thought that I was gonna be able to put that information in that calendar and I deleted my other calendar, which was a big mistake. Um, so I will, um, I don't know. I don't have a good answer for you and I apologize for it. <laughs> All right. Um, she the boss. Thank you so much for gifting that tier one sub starting it off. Right. I will not ignore you on LinkedIn. I promise I won't ignore you on LinkedIn. Uh, I'll be hitting up my LinkedIn right after this. Actually, let me get comfortable. I'm pretty uncomfortable to be honest. Uh, I worked from my office today and I realized what time it was and I rushed home. And now, I don't know if you guys remember, but I'm riding my bike to work now. And uh, it's about a 45 going there. You can get, I can get there. I got there in 29 minutes the other day. It was mostly downhill. Uh, it took me about 45 coming home uh, cause all uphill and it's pretty warm in the evening. So uh, I'm just barely recovered from that bike ride back. It's really not that bad of a bike ride, but it is when you gotta like, when you're in a time crunch. Um, so yeah, what's up, Jackie? Let me, let me say hello to everyone. I'm sorry, I did not, you know, I was almost late, so I got a little bit afraid. What's up, Jackie? Uh, yes, did you figure out what that song was? If not, I will definitely let you know. Andrew Lane, good to see you. She the boss, the she boss, not she the boss, the she boss. I love it, welcome, thank you so much for the gift of sub. Matt Peanut, how are you doing? Ooh, the May Update Bus Virtual Box. The May update bust a lot of things. That's why it's still on hold. You know, actually, I checked daily. I did not check today. Let's find out. Yeah, it's, uh, I still don't got it. I still don't have it. So I will wait because I don't want it breaking. What I need, Linux for the win? Absolutely. Um, I do have my System76 PC on hand, but I really want to get my hands on WSL2 on this desktop. I really want to try out some cool things. Um... Was a YGBSM D flare biking? You know, it's getting easier and easier. The only problem is my bike is not. It's you know when I first got it, it was amazing for what I needed it for. Uh, it is more of a commuter. It's, it's so it's like a gravel bike, and the gearing's not amazing for going uh, fast or long distances. I do some pretty long rides on the weekends, or long for me at least. You know, you know, somewhere around thirty miles. You know, thirty mile rides over the weekend. Um, you know, I'm trying to do it twice a weekend. So I'm trying to ride about 60 miles a weekend. Uh, and the gearing's just not right for it. Uh, it's a one by, so I only have one gear in the front. Uh, you know, bikes are the technology, like all the bike stuff is wild now. And I don't know what I'm doing and there's no, I can't even go ask the shop because it's going to take them four months to do anything. So I had the worst plan in my head. The title wasn't coming. Then the chorus hit. I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. That's what happened to me too. That's what happened to me. I appreciate that. I definitely appreciate that. Ooh, hype train coming. I still have no idea what a hype train is. Uh, I think it is when, you know, a, a various amount of activities happen um, with cheers and bits and stuff. And I, all the all the gifted subs, Sharky, Sharky, I, I, I appreciate that. I promise you tonight, if we play any Warzone, that I will not abandon you if you are being hunted uh, for that gifted sub. Thank you so much. I do appreciate it for the insider program okay i'll um i'll try it i'm scared to do it on this desktop though i need this desktop well uh, i'll be fine i'll you know i have other things to stream with if it breaks all my stuff uh but yeah 
let's see i mean yeah i mean so here's the thing you know we have, we have a group of friends who play a little bit of call of duty and we have different play styles i'm a very aggressive uh player um and you know i, I i'm playing i want to run around and if i see you i'm you know I'm a hunter, okay? I wanna go, I'm gonna go get the person. And Sharky wants to win. So he does what you're supposed to do. And he's pretty cautious. And usually I end up leaving him and then dying. And then usually he has to try to bring us back. The other people we play with are, are you know, one of them's kind of like me and the other one's like in the middle a little bit. So, uh, you, you know, we're an we're, we're interesting, interesting team. I, I Andrew, you got it, you got it. Watch Call of Duty right now on PC. Yeah, I mean, I you know, if I could be watching Call of Duty right now, I would be. I, so here's what I try to do. I, I I will admit one thing that I've really fallen in love with back during uh, the quarantine is gaming. I've always loved to game, uh, but I never really gave myself time to do it. Um, and I was like, oh, I'm getting older. Like, oh, you know, some of these crazy games. I hated how much I really liked it. And, uh, you know, now, I'm, you know, I'm just letting myself be free. You know, I mean, I'm definitely you know, keeping it to, you know, I have my time set aside to game. Um, but like, hey, you know, have fun. It's something enjoyable, you know, I'm not hurt anybody except for the people in the game. Uh, so I like to do it. But tonight we are going, oh, actually, I'm sorry. I think, I think I might have accidentally, I was trying to fix some stuff in Notion. It might not be shared right now. Let me re-click the button. Let's see, is it shared? Uh, I'm sharing this one. Share should be shared. It's not shared. It should be the same link. Uh, let's check. Contained. All right. Uh, yes, that's the same link, and it still works. So you should be able to click day two. Oh, you know what I did? I don't like this. I need some consistency here. Day two. There we go. You know you can't be doing that. You can't be. Can't, you know, can't be using words and then numbers. I did, I still don't know which one it is yet, but I did learn uh, that that is the etiquette for when you're using two numbers in a row in speech, well, when you're writing. I can't remember which one you use first, if you use the word or the number. I think it's number first, if it's less than 10, and then the word, I don't know. I uh, need access to the slides, okay. Let's go ahead and do that. I really thought I wasn't gonna have to do that, but no problem, no problem, here, here it comes. Uh, drive contained share anyone with the link. Okay, if you refresh your page or click on it again, you should now have access to it. And I can confirm by doing this myself over here. And yes, you should have access to it now. There are, you know, there are a number of slides. There aren't as many slides as we had last night on waddle if you're learning a little bit of linux but there are a fair amount of slides so let's see let's copy this paste it in here to click on it let's get started because i don't think to uh you know i we're gonna we're gonna get hands on a lot tonight and we're gonna be messing around um and there's, you know, I don't think any of the concepts are too wild or anything, but uh, let's uh, let's do it. Eh, we'll give people one more minute. I left my good water bottle at work today or in the office. And now I got to use, you know, I could have got a cup or a glass as a normal person would do. But, you know, I have my bike water bottle and it had some water in it with ice that I got before I left the office. And so this is what we're drinking tonight. And I would drink it with the top on, but guaranteed this is like a special, it's like a special like twisty top thing. And it takes a, a massive amount of pressure to get the water to come out and water would go everywhere every time I was trying to do it. And uh, so I'm just gonna, you know, I'm just gonna unscrew the top when I get thirsty. Uh, LaCroix, uh, the LaCroix simply, I just drank it all to be honest. And I haven't been back to the grocery store yet to get any more. So that will be coming pretty soon. You know, we gotta get it. I need to get it in bulk. Uh, I'm, I'm not used to not having unlimited supplies of LaCroix, you know, at my access at any given time. But okay, let's do this thing. 
let's get started day two wait 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 day two of contained docker deep dive an excursion into docker okay let's go i use the button again every day we will make our money's worth for this button spindrift everyone's been talking about spindrift i will definitely check it out or you'll get from work i could too you know nobody's drinking it you know and it might be almost expired so maybe i'll uh maybe i will yoink it from work but today's topics what are today's topics today we're going to learn a little bit more about docker hub um very very lightly hop into docker hub if you don't already have an account on docker hub you'll probably need to create one uh, you won't need to create it to do the things tonight but as we get a little deeper into the course you will um we're going about running Docker containers tonight is uh, really focused around understanding how to run and to manage Docker containers. Now, remember that word means something that's different from images. Uh, that's different from some of the other things. Docker containers are the actual individual running instances of an image. And so tonight we're going to focus on that. We're going to learn about some of the container commands. and We're going to learn a little bit about container management. Um, there is yeah, so there's, there's a lot of things that we're going to run through in here, uh, a lot of little concepts, um, but there are some things that I actually pulled from this one to include in other parts because the flow made a lot more sense um, because there are some uh, there's some of the Docker running commands uh, that the like, paradigms that you kind of need to know a little bit more about some of the other pieces of Docker. So I th still think we have great space to do some of that stuff. So I uh, pulled a little bit out and move some stuff around and put a little bit more in here as well. Um, so yeah, container commands and container management. So hold on to your butts. I hope you all know what that's from. Uh, probably the, it, it, it honestly is probably the, the movie I've seen the third most amount of times in my life. And I'll tell you right now, the movies I've seen the most in my life is uh, Cool Runnings. Number one, you know, Jamaican bobsled team. Some people say they know they can't believe Jamaica. We have a bobsled team. We got the one daddies and the one junior. Sanka, the fastest of the fastest of Jamaica sprinters. Go to the Olympics, by for Jamaica. And so I am actually, you know, I'm part of Jamaican, you know, so that's my movie. Uh, but uh, that's what I've seen the most. Number two is Spaceballs. I used to watch that way too much. I don't know why it's a dumb movie, but I love it. But this, if you don't know, that is a Jurassic Park one, you know, hold on to your butts. This is when they were resetting the power to the park to make sure all of the gates and all of the stuff, you know, came on. We're going to play. I, I, mean, I haven't watched Spaceballs in a real long time. I really need to. Uh, but Sanka, you dead, man? Yeah, man, I'm dead. Um, so let's go let's get started let's talk about the docker hub which is the registry capital t-h-e the registry for docker hub hub.docker.com um you know we we use this for something else and i was like you know what this makes a little bit of sense uh because i couldn't find anything good for registry um but you know a bunch of packages and he's delivering them but it is the default image repository for Docker, uh, so when you install Docker, it's it's the default image repository for each of the images. Remember, we talked about the registry being the, the place where images uh, can go, um, where you can go grab them there, they're saved there for people to get as uh, a repository for images, kind of like GitHub. Uh, Docker Hub, you get unlimited public repos for free and you get one private repo. This is exactly the same model that GitHub used to have uh, but it has since changed. GitHub has become great because Microsoft purchased them and they have a lot of money and they can give you more for free because they're rich. Um, but that's how it works. Uh, there are other tools and things that we'll look at that Docker Hub does provide, but I don't know anyone who uses them. I just know that people use this to host their Docker images. Like there are other ways to host um, images in registries and different repositories. You can host your own. There are other ones just like GitHub is not the only Git repository, there's GitLab and Bitbucket and everything else. Um, just like Git though, uh, to get images from the Docker Hub, you simply pull the images, you gotta log in, but you pull the images down to your local computer or to whatever computer is going to be running the Docker containers. And to when you build images, you push them up. So very similar to how uh, GitHub does things. So the paradigm, if you're familiar with Git, is not gonna be, um, new and it doesn't have all those crazy git features uh, it's a pretty simple paradigm you log in you pull 
you log in you push if you're just pulling a public repository no need to log in at all um so yeah so we're gonna head over to docker we're gonna head over right now you do need to make an account which i really hate you used to did not you used to didn't need an account um i think you need one to even look at the images it's free um you know put in put your email in there and you can kind of get started um wait is it gonna go to the home page explore and again it's really nice um i would take a look around um at this just to like see what's in here there are docker certified images so this is a place this is a public repository so uh, anybody who's pushed public images here you can find them here and so that that means things can get very confusing and so what docker has done is they have certified images which uh they're kind of certifying or coming from the publisher that you know uh, that you should be able to trust um and so you can kind of believe in these a little bit more than some of the other ones um I won't talk about some best practices around that, but so like all these are coming from verified publishers and they're Docker certified. But honestly, you can find just about any application that you want to run. You can find it here. Um, you can probably find an image that you can use. And when you click on one, um, let's go back like to the Ubuntu one just to show you what it looks like. Tells you how many downloads there've been stars. Um, you can find out lots and lots of information about this. Let you know what it is. Um, gives you a little, you know, thing here and it tells you where you can, uh, gives you a link back to the other official images. It tells you how to get it over here on the right. Very similar to GitHub when you are, uh, clicking the little, um, button to see how you, uh, clone it to get the URL to clone it from. Um, and you can find out information about when it was built, what tags are available to you. Uh, I didn't, I've never looked at this reviews tab before. Um, but yeah, they just have all these things. So different tags that you can pull. I uh, remember we talked about tags. So all of these <clears throat> are each of these bullet points. These are three different tags, but they're all pointed at the same image. So I could use any of these tags and it would actually pull the exact same image. That's why they're kind of here on the same line. Uh, remember those tags can be anything and they're just pointed at a um, at an image build. Um, and so if we wanted a different version of Docker, I mean of, um, of Ubuntu, we could select, you know, Ubuntu 16.04 or 14.04. These are other long-term support versions, which are no longer supported. Um, and also non LTS versions as well, like 20.10, which is very interesting because, well, I guess it's in development now. So yeah, um, our containers like headless distros that is, um, I mean, kind of, uh, kind of honestly. Um, and again, so remember a distro, this is not a, uh, this container is not a, have a whole operating system in it. it distributions in Linux are simply uh, packaged up tools and applications. It's a group of tools and applications uh, that this person who made this distribution decides uh, makes sense. And so it's really a collection of those things. Absolutely, we do go over images. Um, when are we going? I think we're going over those on Monday. Um, actually, let, let me, we should really start going over that first, what we're doing. Uh, yes, we're going over images on Monday. Um, so we're gonna run some containers tonight. Um, but I feel like learning about images is not fun unless you can run some containers. So yeah, what's up, Pwned? How you doing? Uh, so let's do, so like, yeah, just look around the hub, you know, the Docker hub, you know, I, I you know, it's the internet. I gotta, I gotta be real explicit with you all. I've gotten some uh, interesting, funny messages and some interesting like screenshots and stuff. Like nothing, nothing bad, but like, you know, every, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of children around here, you know, who they, they're adults, they're adults in age, but they have childish minds. So Docker hub, look around Docker hub. Don't look around the hub, look around Docker hub. Okay. And make sure, you know, uh, just get familiar with it. Not important. I, I pretty much, never go here uh to be 100 percent honest i i very not never i very seldomly go to this um but what is nice is that you can click these tags we don't know about we don't know how to read or write docker files yet but you can click on this and you can see the docker file that was written 
to build the current image that you're about to use. And so if you don't want to use that image, you can also steal the Docker file. You can take this Docker file as well. You can take it, you can modify it as you wish. Um, so that is really nice. That is usually what I go to Docker up for if I need to reference what's in something. Um, so yeah, what's up fairy bot? You did it. You did it. You made it early. Yep. We're at the very beginning. What am I referring to? No, nothing, you know, nothing. I'm just referring to Docker hub, you know, uh, I'm the man child. I am as well. What's up, Pi Lang? Okay. So what we'll do now, um, whoops. Let me move this, let me move this. Okay. What we will do now is now that we know all about Docker Hub, you know, you can see all the stuff here. It gives you some information about how to use it as well. Um, applications that are a little more like, this is the Ubuntu container is really here for you to build uh, your applications off of. So there's not really a ton here for uh, usage information for you, um, but uh, you will see that for other things that we'll get into tonight. Um, so yeah, just, Sign up for an account, it's free. Um, and this is where you go to, when you do a Docker pull and pull an image, um, this is where you can go to find the images that are available to you. And it's also where you can put your own images that you would like to build. Ooh, another gift of sub, the she boss. Now, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna double accept your LinkedIn invite now. Uh, move you to the top of the line for the gift of sub. I do really do appreciate it. Uh, let's see. I mean, yeah, Alpine Linux, we're gonna talk about best practices, I think next time, um, uh, or the either next time or the time after that, uh, when we are discuss like when we get into Docker files as well. And I think we get into Docker files next time. So uh, yes, Alpine Linux. Okay, so let's move on past Docker Hub because there are a lot of slides. Right into it, right into the, I don't wanna say meat and potatoes because meat and potatoes are coming up later. Uh, but now we're gonna hop right into running containers. Uh, I spelled managing wrong, but that's fine. If I went past it quickly, you would have never known. Uh, I can also just fix it. But now we're gonna learn how to run containers. But before we run some containers, that's what you've been here for. You're here to run some containers. You should know a few things specifically about Docker. Things you should know. Uh, the first one, we've talked about it. We talked about it last time, but only one with a little star by it. Containers are designed to run a single process. Uh, and that is, that's how you should approach thinking about them. This does not mean that they only can run a single process. It means that they're designed around running a singular process. So you can have them run more than one process, but they're not really designed to do so. And that introduces another set of challenges. Um, but yeah, you should be thinking about that. You should keep that in the back of your mind. The star is just to say, hey, although um, although it's designed to run a single process, it can, uh, you know, it can do whatever. <laughs> that process can in fact be multi-threaded. Um, it can be multi-threaded. Uh, are you sure? I'm 99% I'm sure they can be multi-threaded now. Um, I'm almost 100% positive, but let's check. Let's Google it, you know? You gotta make sure, but Jackie, I'm pretty sure. Can Docker processes be multi-threaded? Uh, 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 uh. Let's see, multi-threaded application support. Oh, does that cause problems? No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I was like, I was like, wait, I was like, I'm pretty sure uh, Dockers can't perfect. Um, yeah, it can. I was like, oh no, you know, but again, like I said, we'll, we'll always check it out. We'll always Google it. Not a problem. Um, but they can be multi-threaded. Um, but yes, a singular um, process is what they're designed to run. Uh, if you need to run other things, you want to run another container to be hundred percent honest. Uh, you want to try to do that. They, you want to follow the paradigm. There are a lot of cases where you, um, where I've seen the need for more than one process, but most of the time nowadays, uh, with, with the advancements in Docker, uh, that's pretty much, you know, a one process thing. The second thing you want to remember is that containers are also designed to be ephemeral. And this is a very confusing concept. 
um not ephemeralness but like um there because containers do stay oh hold on we'll get to that but because containers do decide uh, uh, do stick around for a while sometimes uh depending on how you build things uh people get confused about this but containers are not designed to be around for long they're they're designed to be ephemeral that means they're not around for long uh once their process completes the container retreats into the night so that one process uh once it finishes uh, the container is assigned to to not you know shut down exit be finished it is successfully done its job um and it's designed to go away um so there should be a star by that as well but it's designed to be ephemeral and the last thing is that uh the data um uh, because the containers are ephemeral the data on the containers is also designed to be ephemeral there are ways to handle this it's one of the first things we're going to talk about next time but um persistent data it says nah yes you can you can do things to make data persist but um you should be thinking hey a container uh, does not persist data um you can save data to a container but because that container goes away um you likely will lose that data and the way that data works within containers in between containers is really odd so think about uh, when you think about containers, think non uh, they're ephemeral and the data is also ephemeral as well. Now, Mr. John Wonton, I'm pretty sure John Wonton, you are already a VIP. Um, but one, thank you very much for the gifted subs. Everyone who got a gifted sub, please thank John Wonton for your generosity. Thank you so much. Really do appreciate it coming in hot. We do all of us. We just genuinely yeah, thank you so much um but yes these things are important these are not all the important caveats of docker but they are important topics to know uh, as we kind of get into this to uh wrap your head around while we're learning how to run certain things and yes mr peanut uh what if you're running a web server in a container or does that not do that yes they do um we're going to talk about exact like I should have put stars by these. I want to give you the, the statements as is. There are ways to handle all of these things. Um, and yes, there are ways to handle all of these things. Um, you know, uh, long running processes, things like that. Uh, I'm going to show you. Um, I'm going to try to find the infographic. People, it always confuses people, but like the uh, average runtime of like of containers is actually really short. It was something like one minute uh, is the average like lifespan of a container period of like all like of like hundreds of thousands of containers run. That was the average lifespan. And again, because they're, you know, they are used to run long running processes, but they're also utilized very heavily to do specific tasks um, because they're quickly spun up uh, and they're, they're kind of efficient in the way that they do their jobs. We will learn, we will actually run a web server two nights. What's Docker, you never use it? Hey, well, uh, you're about to use it right now. Yeah, I guess you gotta stay. So if you have something working in directory, it will not last forever. Um, no, uh, this is always, this is always an interesting one, Lewis. Uh, it will be tied to that ephemeral container. Um, and that container again, can go away. Um, you need to, uh, if you want to save that data, you, you have to move it out of that container in some way. Uh, and there are a number of ways to do that, that we will talk about, uh, Gota CS, oh, thank you so much for the host. I do appreciate that. Really do appreciate it. Okay, let's keep going. Let's run with it. Let's actually run some stuff. Now, I thought this image on the left was hilarious. When I was looking for stuff, it is not quite a running whale, but it is in fact a, uh, like a sexy tiptoeing orca, which I find like it's, it's mesmerizing and I do love it. But that's the new, that's the new thing for Docker Run. I do appreciate that. Like it, it's amazing. It's so good. Um, but Docker Run, every Docker command first begins. Oh, actually, I think there's another slide that I want to show you first. Uh, no, actually this one first. Every Docker command begins by calling the Docker executable first. So if you've never done much from the command line, um, I'm going to, Hopefully you'll understand at least how to run Docker from the command line when we're done with this. So I'm actually gonna go down here and every application from the command line uh, works initially by calling the executable. If you have it installed, you simply type in Docker, make it a little bit bigger and you hit enter and it'll give you some output, but Docker is how you initiate the Docker service. And to run a Docker container, you call Docker 
and you run, uh, you give it the run command. And here's an example down here. We did do one run command last time that was given to us, but uh, you give it, you call Docker, you say run, and you call the image in which you want to deploy this container based off of. And that is the very basic, um, that's the very basic setup of a run command. Um, and so we're gonna use that shortly. You can run that right now if you want. It's not gonna have the intended output that you probably think it's gonna have. And we are gonna do that live in a second. But I first want you to see a breakdown of the Docker command. Here are the different pieces of a possible Docker run command. One is Docker, you need Docker first. Then you need run. Uh, this is a bad example. Um, you need run next. Then there are these things called flags and arguments. Um, we learned about these in Waddle yesterday. Uh, these are different things that modify um, the command that you're currently running. Uh, they give you some extended functionality to do certain things. You're gonna learn about a few of them tonight, a few of the more popular ones, and you'll learn more and more as we go through the course. Uh, so you can put uh, any number of these things in there in between. Then if you decide the image name, the image name actually, oh no, actually, the image, then the image name, um, then the command override. So the only required things, and let's actually put this here. Um, let's put a required, required. This is optional. This is required and this is optional. So um, we'll, add a, we'll add a better example shortly. But these three things are required. Docker run image name is a requirement. Uh, flags and arguments are a are optional and command override is also optional. Now you don't know what any of that means. So we're gonna go over all that. We're gonna go over the flags. I'll also show you right now actually how to get something going. So let's uh, go down here. Yeah, okay, so clear. So when I just ran Docker, if you just run Docker, um, it basically does a Docker help basically. And what it does is it gives you all of the kind of things that you can kind of do with Docker. It's a little overwhelming. Um, so, so if you're new to the command line, don't sweat it. I know it's overwhelming, a lot of text, uh, but this will give you everything that you can do. We are gonna use this command right here, the run command. And if you want to know more about what you can do with the run command, you can always reference it by doing docker run. Actually, I think you don't need to do anything else. Uh, well, you do. Um, I, I want to see if it works the same way, but just a dash dash help. And this will give you all the options you have as well. And again, overwhelming amount of options. That's why we're gonna go through um, a lot of the popular ones tonight. But if you ever need to reference, I put the reference in, um, there's a reference in here for, for this. Everything that is in, Everything that is in this man page is also on this page, which is easier for you to probably read and tells you what to do. Um, but like I said, it'll, it'll probably take you a bit before you start needing to do things like that. All right. Uh, and so let's do a simple Docker run command and we do Docker run Ubuntu. And we saw what we saw last time uh, and it says, hey, I was unable to find the image that you're referring to locally. Um, I, I, this Ubuntu image, I don't have it. Um, I'm gonna go check, you know, the Docker Hub for it. And it went to Docker Hub and it, it checked for it and it pulled it from there. And it pulled, you know, it says pull complete. We're only asked for one image, but like, there's a couple different options here. We'll learn about that. It says download a newer image for Ubuntu latest. And then we get nothing. We just, you know, did, did that work? Uh, we didn't get an error. Um, hey, we didn't get an error. Like, so if I do this, uh, whoops, if I do something like this and I run it, I get an error. I get a Docker error response. Couldn't pull that image, but this didn't give us an error up here. Um, so how do we know what happened? Like, how do we know what happened when we run a simple Docker command? And this is where our first uh, management, uh, container management thing comes in. How do we know what's running? The way that we see what's running, and I didn't bold this as much as I should have bolded, I should have capitalized this as well, to see running Docker containers. Uh, we can see them with Docker PS. So I'm gonna go down, I'm gonna type in, type in Docker PS. 
and this is kind of like docker processes i don't know what they actually call it um we'll see what they actually call it uh what they refer to it as uh in the help command but docker ps will tell you that and when i run it i get some interesting options here uh it says container id image command create a status uh, on your computer it probably is all on the same line it's only because i am like super zoomed in that all these are on different um lines it's you know it's just a these are headings for columns these are different columns here um and they just wrap around if need be but i don't see anything about ubuntu i don't see anything that indicates a container is running um and you say okay like all right if docker ps shows you running containers a container that is running and i don't see it here that tells me that hey my container must not be running i did not get an error that's super weird um but how do i see containers that may not be running so to see all docker containers both running and stopped we can run docker ps dash a so the dash a is a flag uh for the ps command and if we run a let's clear it out run a docker ps dash a and look at this uh we see the same headings that we see before and let's just let's just get it so that they're all lined up uh but now we see options underneath so um these options underneath are showing us that these look like containers and we see two hello worlds and last time we may recall we ran two different hello worlds and this time we see ubuntu and you say okay all right and it says this command here and it says created two minutes ago and that feels about the amount of time uh it's been since we tried to run this ourselves and then it says exited two minutes ago so it was created two minutes ago but it also exited two minutes ago really weird this ports thing is blank got names over here relaxed pike all right, all these have, you know, awesome Goldilock and uh, Zealous n Noise. Noise, I like that. Uh, I like that a lot. Um, but we've got some containers here, and this is how you see all containers. If we had any running containers, they would show up here as well. The dash A shows you uh, how to see, uh, it, it shows you all containers. So Docker PS is gonna show you um, you know, only running containers, only running Docker containers. If you wanna see everything, you can give it a dash A, all right? So that is how we see those things. Any questions real quick about that? I should actually, you know what? I should actually go back and add a, uh, whoa. Does it just does it just run the bash script? Uh, what do you mean by just run the bash script? Oh, oh, great, great question. We're gonna talk. Yes, um, yes, uh, it it just executes uh, bin bash, um, and we're gonna talk about why exits uh, in a second. But yes, it is running bin bash. Okay, so let's talk about this really quick. The things that you see here. Uh, that container ID is a unique ID generated by Docker. No two containers uh, that exist on the, on the system will have the same ID. They cannot have the same ID. Uh, so that first column, this container ID column, yeah, will be a unique ID. And so it'll look like this. This is the container ID right here. They're all unique. You can use that because it's unique. You can always use that anytime you have to reference a container for a command or anything. You can use the container ID because it is unique. One cool thing about that as well, just to give you a little bit of extra Docker knowledge, you only have to reference enough letters or numbers to make it, to make sure that Docker knows what it is. So I have these three containers here. I wanted to do something very specific to one of them. Uh, I would only have to reference the first number because, or first letter or character because none of them share the first, uh, the same first character. Uh, so I can just do like a 
docker stop b or start b and it would try to start this one it would know this is the one that i'm talking about because you know there's no matching cases elsewhere so you don't have to type it all in um that's something that i've learned relatively recently and it's actually super beneficial when you're dealing with a lot of containers you just need enough to make it unique yeah and uh just a little bit extra there the image, the image uh, column there, it just says, hey, this is the image that this container was booted off of. It's good information. Um, the command, the command column is the process that was run when the container was, was started. Remember, these containers are designed to run a single command. Uh, and this is the process that was kicked off when the container started. Uh, that it, you may not know what this process is, but this is the command that was executed when this started. This is where the container um, kind of began its life. Uh, the created time is just when the container was created. Um, the status is um, gonna be whether or not, it's the running status of the container. So uh, right now the status is exited. Um, the, the other ones are, uh, running, um, and by running, I think it'll just show you like a time. It'll just be like up for, you know, two minutes or something like that. Um, are some of the other statuses. I think there's one more for killed maybe, uh, but there are a few statuses, but this is the, uh, the thing that checks whether or not it tells you whether or not a container is running and kind of what's going on with it. Ports, uh, talks about exposed ports and mapped ports. We are going to talk about ports tonight um but it shows you exposed ports in the container and 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 mapped container ports or published container ports as well uh, and then the last one is names uh and this is a unique idea as well um it's the container name it generates them if you do not provide one but you can also provide one they have a whole uh list you can actually go contribute to the list that makes these it basically just pulls two random words uh to make these things like a um like an adjective and a, a noun. Uh, they have a whole list of these things and it creates them and you can in fact add to it if you want. Um, and it's pretty cool. They do, the names are great, but you can also provide container names yourself if you need to. What's up, Daspero? Thank you for the follow. What's up, uh, Joaquin Solis, 93. Thank you so much for the follow. Good to have you. What's up, Ship Shoop? Welcome. Uh, old t three v welcome to the channel b three three nine welcome to the channel what's up uh g b player ninety four welcome uh yuri where welcome uh i think i got everyone pachi codes welcome pink light bulb welcome that was two hours ago so thank you welcome to the channel good to have you okay so that's just a little bit of anatomy of the ps command uh, that shows you what's going on with a container this is a very important screen gives you a lot of information that you need like i said mine looks a little weird because of how it is but you know these are just simply just columns um that give you you know certain information about the container and its runtime now uh, Docker inspect is another one uh, that we're going to use to get information. So uh, when you're trying to manage containers, uh, what you're basically going to be doing is gathering information. Uh, you're doing things to gather information and performing actions based on the information that you get back. Uh, another way you can get good information is with the Docker inspect command. Really good command gives you a lot of information. It may be too much for you uh, right now. Um, but what it does is it spits back the information to you in a format called JSON, which is JavaScript object notation. Um, and it's really key value. It's a bunch of key value pairs. And I'll just show you what it looks like. And the command goes Docker inspect and you choose the container ID or the container name. You can use either one because both of them are unique identifiers of the container. And so let's check this out really quick. Docker inspect, uh, I'll just do B. Uh, and it, you know, it spits out a lot of stuff here. Uh, and JSON, you know, is, is more for machines than people. Um, and actually because we're people, let's simply give it a little bit of color. Um, because you know, uh, Oh no, we need a little bit of color because there's gonna be a little more JSON tonight. I don't have JQ on here. One second, this is not a Docker thing. This I'm just installing a package on my Linux machine. If you wanna learn how to install packages on Linux, that is coming up uh, next 
Wednesday. Uh, you can find all out, find out all about that. All right, so a little bit of color helps out a little bit, um, but you can see that there are keys and then there are values. So network ID, this is the network ID of the container. And again, a lot of information in here that you probably don't care about right now, but throughout your career, uh, there will be times where this information is very important to you. Um, and you can use this to find out basically everything about the container. Everything about the container is on this list right here. Um, everything that you would need to know about the container is in this list. And like I said, maybe it looks probably looks super confusing right now. It's not all that confusing. If you want to see, you know, the status of it, you can find the state status exited running. It is not running. Is it paused? Absolutely not paused. Is it restarting? Nope. And so you can find out when it started at, when it finished at. Uh, look at that. Look at the even goes down into the, you know, little tiny what was that milliseconds. I don't know, uh, but a lot of information here about that. So that's cool. Um, so good thing to know about and we'll use this again when we actually get a container running but How do you keep it running? We you know, we said a container was designed to run a single process We try to run a docker run with Ubuntu It exited and we say oh man, that's crazy Why did it exit and it says the process that the container starts with must be one that can run indefinitely this is um, This is the hard this is one of the hardest things um, it, it really is super problematic sometimes if you're running a process that needs to run continuously. Uh, there's often uh, hacky things you need to do uh, to, to get things to run some, sometimes. Um, but the, one, there must be a process that runs indefinitely or the process that you start, with, the process that you start the container with uh, must be able to run indefinitely uh, for one. So that is something like a web server. Um, but that's not all you need to do. So a web server, you know, starts up and it continues to run. Um, so you need, you do need an application like that uh, it needs to be uh, the settings and configuration need to be set up so that it runs uh, kind of as a daemon or demon or whatever you, I don't know how you say it. I say daemon. Um, and commonly, um, you need to detach yourself from that session. You need to, to, to detach from the container uh, and have it run in the background for it to continue indefinitely uh, or it will be tied to your session and that's using the dash d flag these two things are are uh are kind of work in tandem not all the time but work in tandem something can run indefinitely if you're you know you don't mind your session being taken up by that which is not really good practice but these two things in tandem really do help um this first piece is not really a Docker problem. This is an application problem. This is something that you need to figure out how to do within your application. There are tons of workarounds uh, that have been created to um, to help you with this. There are tons of uh, application. Um, there are tons of images that have been created uh, for applications that may be tough to to um, to get this to work properly with. Uh, that will keep the container running uh, where it's uh, the the process that's gonna start is not gonna send an exit signal um, too early or something like that. So um, this is the hardest part. Um, and then remember this dash D thing here to run something in the background and we'll see that. Uh, let's try this out right now and let's see if this works for Ubuntu. Docker, I thought Docker is meant for short processes. Uh, D flare, it is, uh, yeah. Uh, it is heavily utilized for shorter processes, uh, but it's absolutely utilized for long running processes as well. Um, the interesting thing about that is because Docker containers are uh, so small and can be clustered, um, even in places that have long running processes, uh, they can run in a single container, but uh, there's a lot of container cycling that goes on. So yes, I'm gonna be running Nginx across a hundred containers, uh, but those containers uh, are getting cycled out um, pretty, you know, pretty often. Um, but you can also spin up a container and, and just keep it running. You can just do that, uh, but they are designed. Um, they were, they work well with shorter running processes. A Docker image uh, can, a Docker image run a Docker image and then close the outer Docker image while still keeping the inner Docker image running. So one, uh, I think you mean container instead of image, but you can run an image, run a container, and you're saying start up another container 
in a running one and stop the outer one uh that wouldn't that just wouldn't work um if i understand that properly like that wouldn't work at all um no because the process in that first container would be the one running the process in the second one um so that would not uh it wouldn't what's up steven was the first hour really important um we just we just start we're just starting to talk about how to run docker containers so n not a ton there yet um I'm, I'm actually surprised we're 50 minutes in yes we will absolutely uh we can run nginx on all kinds of ports if we want so let's try to run our command let's try to run our docker run command uh with that dash d so uh bin bash um bin bash can be a long running command it can absolutely be a long running command um but the dash d what the dash d does is it runs it runs the process in the background for one so it does not uh take up my terminal session it, it detaches runs it in the background and it also returns the container id to us so we'll do docker run this is the flag this is one of the optional pieces which is the dash d and Ubuntu. This is the only difference in our command. And it spit back out a container ID to us. Uh, a lot of numbers. This is an indication that a container was created and a container was attempted to be started. Uh, and so if we run a Docker PS, we still don't have a running container. We don't have a running container and we can do Docker PS dash A. Um, and again, that bin bash entry point is, uh, or, or command that starts it, it's running, it executes a shell and that execution of bin bash is basically receiving back, uh, you know, a, a, a successful status code. It's receiving a, a, a zero status code saying, Hey, I ran bin bash and it worked. And the container is seeing that as a, Hey, I successfully completed my process. My process ran. I received a proper exit code and I'm exiting the container. Uh, the goal, uh, like the, the way that you kind of keep things running forever is you have to keep it from getting delivered this exit code basically. For people who don't know how Linux processes work uh, when they run, um, that's how your your your, pro your programs know there was an error that occurred and exit, uh, a, a basically a code is returned uh, depending on what happens during the run of the application. Uh, a zero status code says, hey, all good. We, we did good um, and we ran. And so this did not work. Um, this did not work. And, but just really quick, I think they, this is what they show you on the site after you install, after you install it, um, after you install Docker, one of the examples they give you is a Docker run dash IT. Um, and we'll put a D on there. Um, Ubuntu, we'll talk about these flags in a little bit. It gives us that back. If I do a Docker PS, I do have one running now. I do actually have one running. The reason why I actually have one running is because I passed it a few other options. Uh, the I stands for interactive mode, and I would save this. I would save this. There's gonna be a part later where we talk about what this is, uh, but I would uh, save this Docker run dash ITD. Um, I would keep that handy or IT, but ITD, I will keep it handy because uh, it will help you in the future. Um, and we're, we're gonna dive deeper in that. I'm not gonna go into it yet, uh, but it is running right now um, and it's gonna continue to run indefinitely. And like I said, we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there shortly on a while. Um, so these two things are very, very important. The process and the container must be one that can be run indefinitely and not deliver back a status code of zero or a failing status code. Um, and you probably need to detach from it uh, and run it in the background for it to continue indefinitely. Do we need to understand more about the Docker daemon or just the process you're running? You don't really need to understand that much about the Docker daemon right now. And while we're while we're learning how to run these things, no, you don't need to know much about the Docker daemon at all yet. And we're actually going to dig into the Docker daemon just a little bit um, through the course, uh, but not not important. Uh, it's just a process that you need running. Um, you just need to care about the process that you need running. Um, the process is all that matters to you. Um, and it can be, like I said, it can be kind of rough. Um, sometimes I've spent, you know, custom applications. I've spent, you know, much longer than I would have expected trying to get it to run properly in a container, uh, because it just simply 
would exit it would run it just would simply exit all the time uh it was very frustrating but uh there's there's a lot there's so many workarounds and we're gonna talk about that during best practices okay um now let's talk about some of the uh, management of these containers we, we we're able to like start one up from an image um don't worry about running it indefinitely yet or understanding like why things won't run indefinitely we'll get we'll we'll spend the entire course learning more and more about that um but you know the docker run command will attempt to run a, a, a container it'll create and it'll run a container based on the image that you give it um and we learn how to see if a container is running we also learn how to see all containers that have kind of ever existed here and so now you know we've tried to run a few more and we have a few more in this list this list will be keep growing until we do something about it but let's learn how to manage uh let's learn how to manage these containers a little bit better uh the first thing we're gonna learn about is how to manage their runtime so um uh, or what happens with them at runtime um and so a lot of people don't know about this first one to be honest uh I i've been surprised at how many people don't know about this you generally won't do it um you generally won't do it um but the docker run command that that we've been using is actually it uses this first it actually does this in the background it creates a container first and then it starts it. that is what the docker uh run command does it does both of these things but you can do it yourself uh and creating a container is creating the space uh creating the actual um section off isolated uh application to be run um but it will not start the application so we could simply do a docker create i think you can just give it an image and it gives us a new container id and if i do a docker ps it won't be running and but if i do a docker ps dash a the container id up here is 37 dc 3b and look at this 37 to dc 3bd and it was made from ubuntu and the status is simply created all we did was create the image we did not run the we did not start the container uh the container is not running we simply uh yes we we simply created it we created the space for it. um so great pretty simple um like i said i've actually never if anyone has any scenarios in which they've uh used create uh for real reasons please let me know i've never run into a situation where i needed to create containers uh before running them um or just have containers created so definitely let me know if you have seen that before what's up jumpy bacchus 342 good to have you uh you wouldn't happen to be jason would you you know or, or his brother sorry i don't know his brother's name but what's up how are you doing what's up one stub Good to have you as well. Um, so create will do that. And if we create a container, then we probably should, you know, need to start it. So Docker start will do that. And so you do Docker start and you provide it one of the unique identifiers, either the container ID or the container name. And so I can do Docker start, and then I can give it this container ID right here. And it'll give me a little bit of feedback saying, hey, I tried to start this. Is it started? No, it's not started. It's gonna let me know it died again. But this is for the same reason why it died before. Um, it, it exited eight seconds ago. So it, it started, it did start. And then it died back out. Cause again, just the way that that container is set up, we're gonna do all this again with containers that do actually stay up. It'll be so much easier to see it with containers that do stay up but I really wanted to highlight, you know, their uh, containers are designed to run their process. Th these are not erroring out. This is not an error. It didn't it didn't die. Uh, it did its job. It, it ran this command. This command ran successfully. And it says, hey, I'm done. I did my job. I'm leaving. I'm done now. I'm off into the night, as we said in the slides. But starting a container, you can do that. Now, you can also stop them um, and you can pause them. I've, I've also never um run into a situation where i needed to pause a container um but let's uh docker ps we do have one running container and it's been up for six minutes and let's pause it first um let's do a docker pause and let's use this 
name since we haven't used the name yet. Dr. Paws, Crazy, McNulty, and we'll Dr. Pause it, and let's see what happens. The Docker PS, and it simply still shows it as a running container. Paused, it's still running. You, you all play video games, you hit that start button, the game's still on, but it is now in a pause state. Um, I'm assuming this means we could not get to it if this was an application. Um, like I said, I've never needed to use the pause functionality. Uh, I'm assuming, I'm assuming I can just start it back up. Let's see, I have no idea. No, uh, oh, unpause, unpause is an option. That makes sense. I like that. It says, hey, error response from Damon. You can't start a pause container. Come on, silly, can't start a pause container. Please try unpause instead. So I will in fact try unpause. It told me the answer. I appreciate that, uh, Docker and unpause. And if I do a Docker PS, I can see that the status uh, is that it has been up for seven minutes, which is nice. That tells me that it is running. So you can create a container. Creating a container uh, creates the space for the container. It isolates the application, uh, sets it up, but it does not run the container. It does not start the container. Um, we can start the container. Um, we can also start a container that's already exited. It doesn't have to be one that was just created. We can start one up again that stops. Um, we can pause, we can unpause, and we can stop. And stopping it will now, if I do a Docker PS, because I stopped it, we learned that Docker PS only shows running containers. So Docker PS shows no running containers, which makes sense. And if I do a Docker PS dash A, I will see yet another container that is in here. Um, yeah, that is that is in here. So three minutes ago, it wasn't three minutes ago, but uh, two nine, oh, 17 seconds, this one. All right. So very, um, these are um, pretty basic. I could use kill, kill is the, kill is almost the same as stop. Um, so the, it works the same way. Um, you know, you just, instead of stop, you just do kill. So Docker command the image, I mean the ID or the name that you want to do it against the difference between kill and stop. And this is, uh, this is generally the, um, the difference in, uh, most things in Linux is that stop will issue what's called a SIG term. It'll, 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 um, it'll issue a SIG kill really to kill a process or to, I mean, sorry, it'll, it'll issue a, a command to gracefully, um, exit a process. It'll basically say, Hey, process that's running in this container, please shut down for me. Uh, and because you shut down, this container will not exit. Um, and so it'll try to do a graceful stop there. Uh, when you do the stop kill, we'll say, hey, I don't really care what you're doing. You gotta go right now. And it will kill that process instead of gracefully shutting it down. Uh, to you, it's probably gonna look exactly the same almost all the time. Um, it is possible. It, it is possible for a stop to fail. It's, it's possible for your process to ignore the sig term um it's it's unlikely that it'll happen um but there are ways to have your process ignore a sig term and so that's what the kill is for it's like hey i don't really care what you say you gotta go um so kills for so we try to turn off my computer and an application won't let it yes it is yeah it's like that it is really like that um and so kill is like holding that power button on that pc and shutting it all the way down so those are your basic uh, container management commands uh, for runtime management. Now, uh, container management continued. We talked about the runtime management. But let's also talk a little bit about how to manage these containers when they're not running. Like, you know, all these stop containers that we're seeing in this list, uh, they remain on the system and they take up space. And this is the part that where I've had some pushback where people are like, hey, I thought these things were ephemeral. Like, I thought they were gone. And the 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 runtime of them is ephemeral uh and now they are in a state uh really to be discarded um you can use them again but that's not what you should do um but yeah they, they take up space in the system they do use up space um depending on what you're doing but they, they take up a little bit of space every time you create a new space for one um but you can remove these you need to kind of get rid of these things um and the way that you do that is to remove it um you can do docker rm and the container uh, name or ID, uh, and it will 
it will exit. Uh, but the container must be stopped first. You cannot remove a container that is currently running. You also, uh, well, you cannot remove a container that is currently running. We will get to the other pieces. And so to remove one, I can say, hey, Docker, I know I just stopped Crazy McNulty. So I will do Docker RM Crazy McNulty. And it is right here on the list. It's, it's, this, it's this one right here on the list. And I'll remove it and it says, hey, I get a little bit of output here, Crazy McNulty. And if I do a Docker PS dash A, Crazy McNulty is no longer here on this list. Uh, it is now removed from the system. Um, and so cleaning up containers is uh, is important. Um, like I said, they do take up space. Um, you do wanna get rid of these things, uh, depending on what you're doing. Um, there are containers that people wanna keep around. I know, I know, rip, crazy McNulty, I'm sorry, um, had to go. There are ways to also like, this is what this is why I hate working in between Linux and Max. Uh, just the again ZSH, uh, Bash, like different shells and stuff. There are a number of ways to also do bulk deletes, but there are uh, Docker does not give you good ways to do these things. Most of them are uh, are they're they're cool Linux. You know, using your Linux foo, your Bash foo to be able to do something like that. Any use case for using the dash dash rm and create to run automatically clean up when they exit oh so that's really uh, so i've never used that i've never ever used that uh, and i think the reason i've never used that is simply because um i generally work with docker um using some type of uh, some type of orchestration tool um that sounds pretty cool um I've, i i'm actually surprised i've never seen that before that's let's see Docker uh, run dash dash. That's really cool. Uh, was it? Is it under? Oh, automatically remove the container when next. I love it. Any use case for that? Absolutely. Um, if you just want to keep your computer clean, I don't know. Uh, yeah, that sounds that sounds kind of cool. Um, again, when you're thinking about the containers, you don't really care. The image is what matters. Uh, you don't care about the ins. You usually don't care about the running instance of that container. Uh, so it's usually not a big deal to let it go. Remember, the data in these things is ephemeral, so you shouldn't be storing data that you care about and stuff to these individual containers. Uh, so realistically, you could always you could always put that in there if you'd like. Um, I've actually never used it. That's cool. Um, that's pretty cool. Uh, the default memory. I can't remember what the default memory is. We'll, let's see. We'll, we'll check it in a little bit. I I, I almost want to say by default. It will, I almost want to say if you don't specify the memory, it will allow the container to consume as much as it wants. Uh, I, I want to say that I don't know for sure. Um, don't, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to lie to you, uh, but you can, you can absolutely set um, memory limits, uh, CPU limits as well. Um, but I think if you do not, I think that container is, is capable of consuming literally everything on the system uh, if, you, if you let it. Let's see. And there's, there's, uh, like I said, there's a um, way to get information about these things. There's a uh, while things are running. We'll, we'll, let's wait till we get a running container. There's more information about how to get information from a running container, like how much uh, CPU and memory is taking up, uh, the, what the processes are currently consuming, things like that. There's a lot of cool things you can do inside of here um, to do stuff. So RM is how you remove a container. And remember, it must be stopped. You cannot remove a running container. Okay. The meat and potatoes are running a container. So you're like, hey, what we didn't we just we learned the meat and potatoes? No, not I mean, not really. Um, you're almost never going to run a very basic run command like that. Um, uh, realistically, you're probably, you know, after you learn Docker, you're probably not gonna run any run commands, period. Um, uh, to be hundred percent honest. But um run commands are great because there's a lot of configuration that can happen. Containers are really great, they're really configurable. Uh, there's a lot that you can do with them. Uh, and so let's start talking about the real pieces here of, of, of like running a container. What is it really like? What do the commands really look like? Uh, what can we really do and get done? So let's start off with a very basic one, a very, a very, very simple one here is container naming. All right, my name is Jeff. Container naming, uh, 
can be can be important sometimes. So by default, Docker will generate some pretty dope names for your containers. I love them. They're really cool, but they're not always good for understanding what's going on. They're also not great for automation. Um, they, they may not be great for automation, depending on what you're doing. Uh, container names or naming containers can make things a lot easier uh, to work with. Uh, so there, like I said, there are many scenarios where it will be helpful if we could generate our own names. And the way that you do this is with a Docker run dash dash name. You pass it a new flag, you say cool name, and then the image. So all we did was add in this piece here, which is the dash dash name and give it a name. You know, no big deal. No big deal at all. Um, dash dash name, give it the name. Pretty easy to do. And you can still combine these things with all the other flags. You know, you can build up a really big Docker run command if you need to. Uh, but it's very important to know that names are unique. We said that already, but you must delete because names are unique. You must delete a container um, to redeploy a container of the same name. So if you are naming containers, if you're giving containers names and you have some automation around that um, to, to redeploy a container of the same name, you must first, like let's say that container dies. You can't redeploy the container until you remove the one of the same name. So be, uh, you gotta be very cognizant of that. What's up, uh, TKD boy, 555, how you doing? And so let's name ourselves a container right now. All right, so let's let's run that last uh, run command that worked, which was, oh, was that one? It was this one, all right? So this one gave us a running Ubuntu container um, and actually, you know what we're gonna do? Let's clean up everything. Uh, so there's no containers. Let's start all over. Um, uh, RM, uh, I'm not using a Mac, so I might be able to just do this, uh, but I am using the ZSH. Uh, I might have to throw a Q in here. Uh, error list of processes, uh, Docker PS. Hey, sometimes it deletes them anyway. Um, what happens if I eval? Oh, whoops, not just PS, Docker. Yes. There we go. Okay, so I, this just removed all the Docker containers for me. Don't sweat that. That Again, that's just a, there's a number of ways to do that. You can always Google, how do I remove? You simply Google, how do I remove all of my Docker containers? Uh, someone will tell you how to do it. Uh, di like I said, different, um, different containers, uh, different shells, different, uh, you know, different shells really uh, will allow you to do certain magic. Um, so there's like, there's like 10 different ways to do exactly what I did. I actually don't know what Q does. I just remember that it always makes me add Q. I think Q is a quit and I think it will, um, I think it will stop any running containers, I believe, maybe. Oh, quiet, only display numeric IDs. That's what quiet is. That's what the Q does. Um, so maybe I didn't need, I didn't need Q, but um, it's just, I always see it in when I used to Google it a long time ago. Just remember that. Uh, but sometimes you gotta add in like a, you gotta eval this. Like if, especially if you're a Mac, I think you usually gotta like eval it. And if you're using it with something else, it's all like weird stuff, like really annoying. Um, but I deleted all of them. So we do not have any containers running or stopped. So we're, we're fresh, we can start all over and let's run our run command and let's give it a name. So ITD dash dash name. I don't think it, I don't think the order matters. I think I could do, uh, I always put the name closest to the image personally, um, but I don't think it matters. I think I could put these after if I wanted to, but we'll call it uh, mastermind uh, contained. And that's gonna be the name of the image. And we're gonna base it off the Ubuntu image and we'll run that. We'll run Docker PS, and I know it's in the wrong column, but in the name column, it is now mastermind contained, which is great. That's really exciting. But what that means is now I am unable to do this. I cannot rerun that command. Uh, I cannot start a new container uh, with the mastermind uh, contained name, but I want to be clear because this assigns random names and random IDs, you could run this command as many times as you want it and it would give you new containers every single 
time you did it. I do a Docker PS. And just like that, I have lots and lots of running containers. Um, so that's why the name's important. I can no longer run the, uh, this name command. I cannot use that again because the name already exists. It tells you which container has it. You gotta remove that name container to be able to reuse it. That is very important. Uh, I will do my, I think I can do a Docker. I think I can do the same thing here. I'll stop them all the same way. Um, and so now none of these are running and I will delete them again. All right, so now we have none again. All right, so naming, you, all you gotta do is add the dash dash name and you can name this, uh, yep, queues for process IDs. It, it's quiet and it just gives you, it doesn't give you all the other stuff, it just simply gives you the process IDs instead of everything else. Um, but yes, dash dash name is how you give it a name, you know, all right, cool. You you might need to do that. Again, it's not, it's not required, um, but there are a lot of situations when naming a container makes sense and it may be very helpful for you. Um, environment variables. Now, if you don't know anything about Linux, you might not understand what this is, but configuration is king. Containers use environment variables to make containers reusable across both projects and environments. These variables allow you to set things up such as URLs, passwords, API keys, and API key strings. Um, and the way that you do that is with the dash E. So we're just learning about more and more of those arguments and flags that can modify what's happening. And we can use all these things together in a run command to make some dope stuff, dope stuff happen. But an environment variable, the a variable simply is uh, think about a variable. If you don't know what a variable is as a placeholder uh, for a value. So uh, I might make a variable called name or a variable called my var. It doesn't matter what the name of the variable is, but it holds a value. And because the word is variable, that value can be changed at any time or, or later or whatever. Um, so it's, it's, it's the value can be changed. That's why it's called a variable, but it's a placeholder for a value. So we can set up a value called maybe my variable or my name and set it equal to Aaron. And now whenever we reference that variable in our code um, or wherever that code is referenced in configuration files or anything, it will then be replaced with the value Aaron. And the way that we can do that, uh, so first, again, these containers aren't, Docker's not anything special, it is just Linux. Um, and so these environment variables are a Linux thing. And so I can set a, um, I can set a variable now, but I can also um, just type in ENV and there are a bunch of things set up already um, in, in here. Uh, there are already a bunch of variables that uh, Linux sets up by default that it needs to run. Uh, and so you can see they're all, and they're all in caps here. Uh, and they equal a value. So if I were to ever look for home, so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna echo out to what this home variable is, and you'll see that it's the value home mastermind. And so I'm gonna do an echo dollar sign home, and instead of home, it's prints out slash home slash mastermind. And so. We can pass this information into our containers. We can set these variables inside of our containers uh, so that they can be used within our applications or within whatever we are doing. Um, and again, it's used for configuration. It's used to uh, maybe tell your application uh, what the database connection string is and the password as well, or or the URL in which it can get certain things at. Um, and so you use these very, very heavily. Um, we'll learn all about like, it'll make way more sense why we would want to use these things when we start to build our own images. Um, and we're going to be, you know, having to configure them in a way that certain information can be passed in. Um, but it'll make more sense th then, but you can simply, um, do that by adding it into the run command. So let's take off names. So this doesn't get too, uh, no, let's watch it get too long. So I'll leave ITD on there. Uh, and then dash E. E is for environment variable, and you can provide an empty environment variable. So I could provide an environment variable called name or, you know, or age. 
and it would set up a space for environment. It would set up a variable on the system. It would make it available, but it wouldn't have a value. Um, so great, that will be a few for using that later, but a lot of times you'll be giving it a value. I'm 30 years old. And so age 30 is what we would have here. And we haven't learned about this yet, but if I do this, um, Dr. Exec, uh, a, 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 um, slash, uh, echo dollar sign age. I think this will work. Uh, I didn't work. Um, I will check that. We'll log into that in a second. Um, or maybe because I didn't give it a dash. I, let's see, or T. Okay, we'll, we'll check that out in a second. Uh, we'll see if we can get that to work. Um, but inside of this container, inside the container that we just ran, which is here, the container is running. Also check this out. Docker inspect. Uh, let's actually pipe this to JQ. Um, let's find, let's find on this list, a lot of stuff here. But let's find, uh, there's a place on here for environment variables, not gonna grab for environment variables, uh, but I kind of just want to search through because uh, it's fun, you know? Uh, let's see. Yeah. I could either grab uh, or I could use JQ to find this, but you can also see these things in here. Host name, environment variables. Check this out. I said age equal to 30. That is an environment variable that exists in this system now. Whoa. And you can see, you can confirm, you can use this information to confirm that it got set properly um, inside of the system. So that is, that's great. Um, it works. Can you specify a variables file? Yes, you can still, um, it is Linux. So you can still, if you wanna do that, if you wanna specify a variables file and source that uh, in in the environment, you can and you can do that as well. Um, that does That does work if you wanna do that as well. Question, does Docker run on Windows 10 Home now? iPhone fan, it does if your computer has the Windows 2004 update, the May update, uh, and you're running WSL2. Um, not a lot of computers have that right now, I don't think, because uh, there were a bunch of problems, but yes, it does, uh, but only once you have that update, they're still fixing some things before they deploy it to everyone. Um, but yeah, if, you have, if you're running on the 2004 build, um, it does in fact work for you. You can, you can get it on home. All right. So that's an environment variable for you. Again, you can set up the environment variables that you need. This is used to configure your applications. It is very, very important. It's why, uh, it's the way that you can, uh, you can use the same container, um, for your all of your environments. So you might have a developer environment, a staging environment, a, a, a QA environment, a production environment, and you can use a single Docker container or Docker image, single Docker image to deploy in each of those environments by changing up the variables that are used, uh, the environment variables that are used in each of them. Uh, so yeah, everyone here learning Docker and I'm still here learning linked list and see, uh, you are, you're, you know, linked list and see, is above our is above my pay grade, okay? You know, I, I don't want to learn any C. I don't want to know anything about C, except that I appreciate it for making other things possible for me. Uh, so, let's see. Um, what else do we have? A little bit of time left. Um, ports. Ports are great. Ports. Um, ports are. Um, their 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 protocol their channels um on a on, i don't want to <laughs> i don't want to make ports too complicated because we don't for you to learn docker you do not need to be an expert uh, a networking expert uh but ports are just uh they're a lane of communication on a server there it's it, it it's a way for things to services to communicate um on a machine and since containers are isolated, so containers, uh, we learned that, that a container, you know, allows you to run an application in an isolated fashion. It's isolated from the host machine. You must explicitly expose them to the outside world. So let's talk about them a little bit more. Let's talk about ports a little bit more. Uh, things, well, we learned about some of the ports of, of common applications during 
uh, the, the DevOps stuff, and we've talked about it a little more for the cloud stuff, but things like uh, the web, the, the internet runs over two ports, uh, really one nowadays, nobody really runs over, but it runs over two ports. Uh, port 80 is the common one, it's the port for HTTP, that's Hypertext Transfer Protocol, um, and that's the that's the port for the web. Uh, but commonly what you're interacting over is port 443, which is for uh, HTTPS, which is Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure. And so you see this little, um, little lock up here that says your connection is secure. That is because you are receiving a T, you, you know, you're, you're operating over a T over TLS uh, using a TLS certificate. It's encrypting your connection between the site. Um, but that is operating over port 443. Other services, databases, MySQL uses port 3306. Uh, there are a bunch of different services that you that like utilize different ports. Uh, SSH runs over port 22. Um, and so for you to use these things in containers, uh, you know, you can use them no problem. But for uh, because they're isolated, you must expose them. Uh, you must expose these ports and the containers to allow them to be used in the outside world. Can you expose a physical or virtual Ethernet interface? Um, well, these are containers, so you can't really expose a. Uh, I mean, I mean, it has access to the the, the, the physical one is going to be there. Uh, I'm actually not even sure I fully understand the question for the container itself. Uh, the container itself, Docker networking is very interesting. Um, uh, I, IBM does a pretty good job of talking. They have a video on Docker networking and it's pretty good uh, if you know networking. If you don't know networking, um, if you don't know networking, it's not that good. And I'll put it here and I will put it here. Uh, if you want to dive into the deeper, uh, the way that, um, you know, that natting works inside of the different networking options. Uh, if you want to dive into, uh, the way that it bridges connections, um, I would, I would check that video out. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. I understand the, con can you expose a physical or virtual ethernet interface? Um, so your machine, uh, it's probably, you can expose it over a physical or virtual ethernet interface. So yeah. Can you treat a port that isn't 80 or 443 as HTTP and HTTPS? Yes. Uh, yes, you can. Um, absolutely. You can. The problem is, um, other people will need to know that. So we're going to talk about proxies and things as well. Uh, and so that's the one really cool thing about these, about, uh, containers is in the way that you can do some networking and routing and mapping is that you can actually map these to other ports, um, on your computer if you need to. Um, it's also commonly known that you can't run, um, if there's for some reason, if you needed to run two different web servers, uh, over web ports, you needed to really deliver these, these experiences. Um, uh, you could, you could not because they would need the same, they would take up, they would consume the same port. Only one service can consume a port at a time. You can't have multiple services running over the same port. So you can actually do some proxying to allow this to happen on a machine. Uh, and it's really nice. Now, um, you can, you can run a web service on any port that you want. The problem is people who try to ret retrieve it, uh, your browser, knows to go to port uh, 80 and 443, uh, you can change the port that you're trying to access over. Uh, so if I were to go to www.google.com, it's operating over port 443. If I did a colon port 80, um, it's actually gonna fail because uh, Google probably is not gonna serve any data over port 80, but I'm trying to communicate with it uh, over HTTP. Well, I would have to change this as well. Actually, this actually might work. Well, this changes it as well. Uh, so that does work, but it just redirects me. Uh, but if you were trying to get to port 8080, um, it would request it over this port, putting a colon there. Um, they would need to know to do this if you were running on a non-standard port. Um, so yeah, let's get back into this. Cause how much do we have? Oh, I think port is the, oh, cool. Cool, oh, cool, we're good. Um, so you need to expose these ports, but exposing the ports, all exposing the ports does is allow the container itself to now have this port opened uh, for the retrieval of data. Now, we're not diving into networking quite yet. 
to the Docker networking quite yet. But if this were the case, things would have to explicitly be able to connect to your Docker container to retrieve these things. Um, and so it would be for uh, other internal services uh, kind of in that Docker space or machines that had access to, to uh, that were networked uh, in a way that could connect to this container. Um, so exposing is great. Uh, you need, it needs to happen if you wanna be able to use that port. Again, think about web servers. If you're building a, an Apache or Nginx server, uh, an image, uh, you need to expose that port. Even when you run it, you need to expose that port. But uh, what a lot of people, what's, what's really cool is your ability to uh, map these ports or publish these ports uh, externally. Um, and this is on, this is specifically on the Docker's default networking scheme. There's a lot of networking options as you have, but on Docker's out of the box default networking scheme, uh, you can simply map or publish these exposed ports to a port on your host system. So this is why uh, it's kind of cool. This is why you can like use a container in place of, you know, worrying about uh, installing the service itself. Um, and you can use that with the dash capital P or dash lowercase p. If you do capital P, what will happen is the port that you have exposed will automatically be uh, mapped to a port that is available. It, it, it lies in a certain range um, and it will automatically map it to a random port in that range. The second one is the one that more people uh, you're probably going to do more commonly. And what this does is it allows, it allows you to explicitly map a container port to a host uh, a host port, a host machine port to a container port. I do not know if this is the right uh, order. I never remember. I went with the one that I thought and I was like, you know what? I'm going to yellow this and hope that I'm right. I never remember which one comes first. Uh, if it's container port or host port, but we're going to find out really quick. And so let's do this very specifically with an Nginx container. We know we've done a lot with Nginx. It's always the go to because it's simple to use, um, but an Nginx container and let's learn. Let's like use some of our Docker commands to get here. Nginx for anyone who doesn't know is a web server. It is how it's, it's an application that serves information over port 80 and 443. It knows how to respond to uh, to web requests. It knows how to do them. It knows how to respond to them properly. Um, and so uh, we're gonna, you know, let's, let's go through the whole process. Let's say you were like, hey, you know what? I think I wanna deploy an Nginx container. Let me head over to hub.docker.com. And get here and say, I really wanna use Nginx. I have a custom one here, I think we did four months ago, uh, Nginx, you type it in, you say, ooh, look at this, Nginx has an official build. There's an official build of Nginx. It's got over 10 million downloads and over 10,000 stars. That's the one, that's the one I want. It looks great. So I'll click on it and I'll say, all right, got some options here. And it says, hey, you wanna get this? Copy and paste Docker pool Nginx now. Remember what we said about Docker tags? You might say, hey, what version of Nginx is this? How do we know? And always, if you do not put the, the tag on there, it will always pull the latest version. But if you have specific versioning needs, simply check this out right here and you can choose your versions and you know, whatever. But we're gonna use the latest, really great. So I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull it. I'm gonna pull this uh, image down because I do not have it. Docker pull in Nginx. And it says, hey, you're using the default tag latest because I didn't provide a tag. And it simply went and it downloaded what we had pretty quick, you know? And remember, we, I think we already learned this a uh, bit. You can type in Docker images and see what images you have locally and have the Nginx one. This image was created four weeks ago. So the created date on images is different. Uh, it is not when you got it, it is when it was actually created. And you can see the size here, uh, not tiny, uh, but you know, also not wild, like not wild and crazy, but uh, not tiny either. Um, so we have this image available to us now. Let's go ahead and let's run this. Let's do uh, Docker run Nginx. Let's see what happened. Actually, are we, do we have anything running right now? We do. Docker, uh, stop, a, a, and, and Docker, remove, remove, 
a a ah oh, whoops oh there we go okay um cool so now we have no containers i don't even know why i did just a ps you can just do a ps dash a that shows you everything okay no containers running let's try to run nginx really quick docker run nginx okay what happens is the container starts up and what will happen um this is why we talked about the dash d flag is notice how my cursor never went back to the prompt for me to do anything i'm gonna open up another tab um so i don't end it if you, if i were to control c out of this it would actually end it this docker run is tied to my current session uh what's up uh brino seven coder what's up good to have you king christoph welcome to the channel good to have you interactive uh e e kind of um it's basically sending the information to standard output uh here and it's attached to the session that i currently have if i if, like i said if i were to control c out of this it would actually end the session but in another tab here i'm gonna see if anything's actually running and nginx is running okay check this out nginx is in fact i did a run i gave it no other flags and it is running properly okay it's it's it's, it's running properly and let's look at the stuff we we'll make it a little bit smaller so we can see i know it's tiny but what you can see here that we didn't see before is that underneath ports port 80 is here and port 80 is available okay it's there you might say all right cool i got nginx running on my computer that probably means i can hit up you know like localhost uh localhost localhost you know it's running over port 80 can't get there if a yeah, localhost is the web address it's the it's the domain name for your local machine everyone can use that if you're running a web server locally localhost refers to your own system and it says all right you know refuse to connect that means generally a web server is not running it's not available but it says all right it looks like this port is exposed um i can do a docker uh the docker info will give me let me inspect this again um i can get an ip address for this really quick um docker inspect six seven and network bridge i may be able to hit it here so this is the ip address that it kind of has on my system maybe i'll be able to hit this and if i try to hit this ip address it works all right that works we have a running instance of this on our computer but this is not really useful to this it, it's useful for local development it's useful for for local uh for local access of things uh, my computer is networked in with this container and it can access this but none of you are able to connect to this this is an internal ip address go ahead and type this into your browser it won't do anything uh and it, it, unless you have some container running as well um i'll give you this it is only local. Um, and so this is running locally on my computer, um, but this is the actual address for this running container. Um, that's my question. You can have more than one Docker container running on port 80 because you can give it different IP addresses. Uh, yes. Um, and, and not even really because of the different IP addresses, but um, more so because of the isolation, but yes. Um, yes, you absolutely, uh, you can, have more than one Docker container. I can have, I can spin up, and I'll, we'll do it right now. We'll do it. We'll do it right now. Um, we'll do Docker Run Nginx. Whoops, I did not mean to do that. Okay, <laughs> Docker Run. Okay, so to again the the dash D that we talked about is gonna run, you know run this in the background. So I can do Docker Run dash D. Docker Run dash D. Docker Run dash D. And now I have a bunch of Nginx running and I could grab the IP addresses for these things and they would all serve up just fine. Um, uh, they would all serve up just fine. Um, and they are not on the same IP. I, they shouldn't be on the same IP. Um, Docker inspect. There's an easier way to get this information out of here, um, but 7F. 
uh yes they all are going to get uh different internal ip addresses based on the network connection that comes from again the default network configuration that we currently have going on so copy and you know another ins instance of nginx running right here great excellent really nice um you know all these different nginx is running at the same time okay but that's great and all but let's say this was a server let's say this was a you know an actual web server and i really wanted this to run um, i really wanted people to be able to access the sites that i was running off of this nginx server um how do i make that happen because these internal ip addresses mean nothing to the public uh but the the host ip address does and so what you can do um is you can map explicitly to the uh to a port on the on the host machine so we're gonna do this in two ways first let's stop all these first Uh, let's stop them all. Let's delete them all. So now there are no more containers anywhere. Let's spin up two more uh, Nginx containers. Uh, let's spin up one more. Um, and with the dash D, we're gonna we're gonna use first we're gonna use a dash p and all we're gonna do is dash capital p what's up uh free root kits uh, i like the name i like the name you're scaring me just a little bit um you know everyone loves a free root kit but uh not me not me please don't hack me thank you um and so whoops all right so now we ran this with a with a dash capital p and check this out right here look at how different the port looks um than it than it did before let's make it a little bit smaller it says 0.0.0.0, .0, colon port we've seen that colon port number before 32768 and there's an arrow to port 80 tcp and what that does is that shows the mapping my computer automatically did to the to the to the mapped port to the exposed port and so what it did is it mapped the exposed port 80 inside of the container and it mapped it to port 32768 on my machine uh and so now it's it's hooked up to the host machine and this is again imagine that my computer was the server uh now if the host server is networked up to be able to for people to be able to access from the internet now people would actually be able to access this over port 32768 not over port 80 yet we haven't learned how to do that yet but you would be able to do it over 32768 and so if i type in localhost uh just localhost by itself again still won't work because it's not being so served over port 80 it's being served over port 32768 and we do in fact get a nice nginx welcome screen here so this web server works uh we can do the same thing let's do it with apache as well um let's uh docker run apache i don't even know if this is the name of the image um pull denied uh really apache makes you or maybe it's httpd ah there we go there we go um and i didn't mean to do that uh let's do docker run dash d dash p uh httpd and we do it again we're gonna get a new uh port it's gonna map it to another random port so it matched it matched httpd to 32769 so it just went up a port number and if i do localhost 32769 I have an it works Apache server running on here as well. Great. Um, Steven Yeet. Um, we cover how to get a uh, data to persist. Yes, that is the first thing we're doing next time. I believe I really, I really need to have a better way of showing people what's next. Um, but yes, data pers uh, persisting data is literally the first thing on Monday or Tuesday. Uh, it's the first thing that we're gonna be talking about. So, yep. 
use a Trello board to uh, that would be I feel like that's for a uh, use a Trello board for like a calendar and like a like a syllabus. Like we need like a syllabus is really what we need. Uh, but I don't know. We'll figure it out. We will. We will absolutely figure it out. We'll fill, uh, with a syllabus with a calendar like on a calendar. There's some like we can do it. I'm just I just haven't done it. So, okay, so that is the um, that will map. And so you can expose more than one container. I mean, more than one port in a container. Um, and so this dash P, it would actually map every exposed port that was a part of that container, part of that image uh, to this machine. That's what the dash P, the capital P does. But if we wanted to be explicit, if we wanted to um, stop, Let's remove if we wanted to be very explicit about that we can do run uh let's do it with the let's do it with uh no so with nginx do a lowercase p and i say hey i want to actually map port 80 on the host machine to port 80 on the container and this is the explicit matching that you, you can do you can map it to whatever port you want that's open and if i do this now now if i just hit localhost it does in fact work over the, the internet port that we know it should be working over. Um, and so that is port mapping. That's how you map ports in between um, exposed ports to host ports. Um, and again, things can work a little bit differently, like access and things can work a little bit differently when you are using a, a different networking methodology inside of Docker. There's a few different networking um, options for you, but this is, you know, a lot of people would just do this and 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 uh, use the default networking setup. Even if they have their own networks set up, uh, they're using that kind of default, like, you know, bridge networking mode setup. So this works pretty well. It totally can show you a calendar if you assign due dates to items. Okay, well, there we go. That's actually sounds like a good idea, actually. Do you use any GUI for managing your images, containers, volumes, like port container? I do not. Um, I'm not against it though at all. Um, I just, I don't, I learn, I mean, I've been a Linux user for a long time. So like I'm more comfortable on the command line than from a GUI. So like I, you know, I, I never did that. There's a few others, like I never seen port container. Uh, I think the one that was like going big for a while, I don't know if it's still an actual project was Kitematic. I don't know if it's still a thing. Oh, they're Mac, are they Mac only now? I think they used to be Windows as well, but Kitematic is one. What's Portainer? Um, yeah, I've never, this is kind of cool. I, I'd happily, if this works on Linux, I'll download it right now, actually. But I don't know, I've never used, never needed to use these things. Um, and so it looks like this is for, you know, if, if you have your own, um, this isn't locally, is it? Is this local or is this managing? Oh, this is a, is this a registry? Hmm. Management in both swarm Kubernetes environments. He's a, hmm, okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've never used anything like this. Like I said, I, I use the tool, native tools uh, that I'm used to. You can manage both local and remote hosts and clusters. Okay, that's cool. I know it's almost nine already. Uh, we do have a little bit more. Let's let's get through it. Um, that's why I almost stuck too much today. This is I'm glad I pulled some of the stuff out of today because uh, it would have been it would have been a lot. Um, all right. So another thing, another two things. Um, it is really all one. Um, you see me do this already. Um, is execing, um, and this is just executing commands. Uh, against a container, the exec command simply executes a command against a running container. You must have a running container for you to uh, to execute a command against it. And so, um, very simply, um, let's start up a Docker stop C3. Um, let's do one of the Ubuntu ones again without Without that, uh, without it being called mastermind. All right, so um, we have a, a Docker container running, <clears throat> and it's running. You know, it's running the command bin bash. Um, 
and we can execute commands against this using the docker exec command sure for execute um and so we all we need to do is specify again the one of the unique items about it and so we're gonna call let's use the name here so eager dude knee um and then you give it after docker exec uh the name of the the name of the container or the container ID. And then you give it the command that you want to execute a simple Linux command, whatever Linux command you want to execute against it. So I can do something like LS slash. I want to do an LS command on the slash directory. And it goes ahead and it simply executes that command against it. So this was like me being inside of the container and running LS while I was in the slash directory. So you can see what's going on. Um, I don't know if you can do things like top. Um, yeah, there's like, there's only weird things you can do because of the way of the way certain containers are set up, but like I can do an LS dash LA, LA on proc. And I can see what's going on in here. So I'm executing a simple Linux command or whatever, maybe it's a complex Linux command, but you're executing a command, um, in that container, you're actually executing a command against that uh, container. Um, so yeah, so exec is really nice. Um, I use it more, so I really only use it during development, um, but it is really nice uh, to, you know, be able to get information or do certain things. Um, Especially, like I said, when you're trying to build, when you're trying to understand a container, you're trying to build uh, new things, uh, it, it's, it's pretty helpful. Uh, but the probably the, the most common thing you're gonna be doing with this exec command is you're going to be logging into the container. Can you log in the container? Kinda. People will always talk about it as, hey, log into the container uh, because it's the paradigm that makes sense to us in our minds and the way that we usually think about computing. But you're not actually logging into the container. Um, you're not actually logging in. Can you log in the container? Well, kind of, but not really. Uh, you don't log in. Rather, you use the exec command to execute a shell. We talked about shells yesterday, last night in Waddle. Uh, shells are simply programs that are able to interpret our commands um, from the uh, command line um, and 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 have that um, you know uh, kick off processes on the computer. Uh, so it interprets our command, kicks off processes, um, and so you execute a shell, um, a shell session, a shell session, a shell session in that container. Then you can interact with it how you please. So. You do not, uh, you don't really log into it, but again, it's like logging into the container. And how do we do that? Great question. We have this running Ubuntu container. So just a vanilla Ubuntu container. Um, and so let's go ahead and get it in. Wouldn't you spend them up with everything you need already? Yes. Uh, generally, yes, you would. But during, again, development for debugging, for a lot of reasons, um, there's a lot of reasons why you would like, where it makes sense to log into a container um, or exec into a container. Uh, the way that you do that is you use the exec command. Now you need two flags here. You need two flags here. You, there must, there must haves. And this is why I told you to memorize it in the beginning. You need an I and a T. What do these do? The I stands for interactive mode. This allows you to uh, to interact, to fit like to interact with the container itself. Without this, you could not, uh, you couldn't do anything in the container uh, once you were in there. Um, but you also need another one to be able to interact. You need a T and T is for TTY. And TTY is a uh, thing that says for teletype. And it basically is what will give you your keyboard and what it's what allows your your keyboard to be connected into the container. So you need the I and the T every time you want to exec into a container or log into a container. And then you just need the container name or ID. Uh, so I'll do 66. And then you need to execute the shell against it. Now, this is already running bin bash. So I think I can just do this. I cannot. 
uh, you need to give it uh, it's an exactly you need to give it a command um, But you need to give it the shell that you want to execute and it has to be a shell that's already installed So bin bash is always your safest bet. I think um, and Now you can you can see that I'm no longer where I currently was in the command line. This was my prompt before This is my prompt before but now it says root at and this is the container ID and now I am essentially inside of the container um, and I can do whatever I want here. Um, and I can do an LS, I can see what's in here. Um, I can see what's going on. Uh, I can install things. I can, you know, I can do a sudo. I mean, I can do it. I don't need to do sudo because I'm already root. I can do an apt update in here if I'd like. I can do whatever I want to do in here uh, once you're inside of this. Now, again, this is, a, this container is a running instance of an image. Whatever you do here is only isolated to this container itself. It's it's only happening here. Uh, so um, one, once you're done with it, uh, like you can do everything here. Once you're done with it, you're kind of done with it. That's why it's nice sometimes to log in and see what you need to do. Um, and I actually encourage people, especially if you're learning Linux right now, while you're also trying to learn Docker, when we learn how to write Docker files, I encourage you to start up a container just like this right uh, do all like follow some kind of guide if you want to install a web server or something follow a guide learn the commands necessary do them manually in here and then it'll make it much more easily to translate those into a docker file when you need to do it um but i can do it like i said i can do whatever i want in here you know i don't think i have them in here but now i can apt install them right on inside of here and them will be available again only in this container. Um, now, we talked about it before, but it's frowned upon, don't do this. Uh, all the stuff that I, I'm, I'm doing here, it is possible for me to save it. We'll learn about that later as well. It's possible for me to create an image based off of what I do here. I highly, highly recommend that you do not do this. Only do this in extreme circumstances. Um, extreme circumstances, do not do this. Uh, because again, it, you it you won't be able to replicate the system. There's no documentation for the system. You will not be able to, uh, you'll never be able to build this again um, programmatically. You'll have to remember all the things that you did. Um, it's better, if you know what you did, it's better to turn this into a Docker file than to, to log in and build this thing up like this. Um, it, trust me, it, uh, like, in the beginning, it'll be very tempting to log into a container, build out what you need, and then save that again. It's it's not it's a it's not a good practice. It really isn't. What is the standard for updating a container? I update my PC every day, for example. Uh, but what would that do anything harmful to the container because of its nature? Uh, great question. Uh, note which you would not update the container. Uh, you would update the image and re-tag that as either the latest or whatever version you have um, every so often. Uh, you do not need to do it every day, but if you decide to do it every day, feel free um, and you'd update the image instead. My FTP server was DDoSed, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, that sucks, that sucks a lot. Um, that sucks a whole lot. Can you disconnect? Can you connect and disconnect from a running container? Yep, and so I'm connected to it right now. Um, I can disconnect by doing a, actually let's, let's look at some stuff in here really quick. That's really interesting. Um, we learned in Linux, can do PS to see what's running and check this out. If you run PS uh, on your host machine, if you run a P, if I run this on my host machine, I'm gonna get so much more output than this. And I'll show you here, um, run a PS dash A U W X. Look at this, I have like, I have like scrolls and scrolls of, of things that are processes that are running on my host machine. Uh, in the container, you only have a couple things. And PID1 is the only PID that really counts, uh, to be 100% honest. PID1 is the one that matters. Um, you do need to be careful when you are exiting the container not to accidentally kill PID1. Um, but to exit the container, simply type exit. I do control D uh, to get out of it. And you'll see it's still running. It's still running, but uh, yeah, you can just type an exit or do control D to get out of it. So exec into it, 
and then control D or exit to get out of it. Um, and there was, man, there was one, I think there was one more thing to log in. Um, maybe that's it. I feel like there was more here, but we're right at nine anyway. But that's the basics of uh, managing uh, containers. This is the basics of container management. And again, container management, what are the things that you wanna do? Uh, we learned how to run containers uh, using the run command. And we learned that there's you know, a couple of different pieces, you know, there's flags and things that we can add on to do different things and to configure our run a certain way. Uh, but basically you do Docker run the name of the image and essentially that's what you would want to do. We learned that containers uh, are designed to run a single process. We learned that they are uh, designed to be ephemeral um, and that they are designed to not persist data. The data is also ephemeral. Um, so they're designed to kind of do their job and exit. And we need to keep that in the back of our mind as we are dealing with these containers uh, because it's very important. We saw that when we tried to start up an Ubuntu container, it would start it would run successfully and then would exit because the command that was executed ran successfully. Uh, the, some ways that we can make this run indefinitely is one, the command that's executed must be able to be able to run indefinitely. Two, uh, you, you generally need to detach from it uh, and, and run it outside of your current session using the dash D flag. I will provide you so, during the best practices day um, on some of the containers and tools you can use to uh, make containers run indefinitely because sometimes it can be tough. Um, if we were to build our own Nginx container, um, you would see that it's it's easy for the most part. And then you get to the actual command that you like what you need to do to actually make it run indefinitely. And it's, you know, it's, it's not super intuitive. Um, and maybe we will do that because that'll be fun. Um, we also learned, you know, some of the other things, the kind of the meat and potatoes, we could give these containers names. And actually before that, we learned that we could, you know, start containers, we could create containers, stop them, uh, you pause them um, and remove them. We learned that you can stop or kill them. We learned the difference between those is that stop, we'll try to gracefully exit the process, but kill, which is, you know, uh, it'll chop it off um, and it'll, it'll kill the container. We learned that stopped containers do not leave the system they are still there on the system and they can be restarted uh, if you want to restart them uh we learned that uh you so because they stay around the system you should remove them uh using the docker ps command um we learned that docker ps will show you the things that are running docker ps will show you the things that are running and not running um we also learned that uh you can give containers names, uh, even though they are generated automatically. And if you do give them a name, you gotta be careful because you cannot delete a container or I mean, you have to delete a container before you recreate a container of the same name. Names are unique, so be careful with that. We learned about port mapping. We learned that you must expose a port to expose a service in a container. You must be explicit about that because these things are isolated. And, um, and so exposing them is one piece and that allows the container itself uh, to be accessible, but if you want to um, allow that information to pass through the host machine, you must map those ports. You must publish those ports with the capital P or lowercase p um, there. Um, and we also learn about uh, execing. You can run Linux commands against these uh, containers that are that are running only um, using the exec command, the name of the container, and whatever command it is that you want to run. We learned that probably the most common time you're gonna be using this is to log in or uh, to be able to, you know, run commands inside of a container and you're gonna be execing a shell basically uh, to be able to enable you to do that thing. Um, yeah, and so I would play around. It's, I'm, I, I promise you, we're gonna do real tangible stuff with this and it's gonna contextualize a lot of the things that we've done. Right now, just understand, hey, there are containers that I can start. I can stop them. I, you know, I, I play around with them, try to start some stuff up, try to stop it, you know, delete some stuff. See, see if you can see what's running. We learn about uh, ways you can gather some information. Uh, I wouldn't harp on using Docker inspect too much. I wanted to give it to you now. Uh, but if you're, you know, if you're starting out with this stuff again, that JSON, all that JSON is really going to confuse you. Um, so don't worry about that too much, but, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's it. Anyone have any, any questions? IJB that boy. Thank you so much for sticking around for that long three months. You know, I appreciate that.
I've got a weird issue I cannot figure out, maybe you know. I'm trying to build an image with node and FFmpeg where I have a line of code that uses bracket notation. Ho, 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 ho. Such as uh, uh, const config equals con configs env. Yep. Uh, where configs equals default export of node with an object whose keys equals the node env string. Okay. I tried using different versions of node with no luck. Works fine on local, but won't work in Docker. Um, so it's trying to, uh, you're trying to use node env um, and you're trying to use the configs inside of a container. I, we, I use node inside of a container every day. Um, a default export configs default export object is equal to node env string. So I, I would need to know a little more. Um, can you hop into our Slack uh, S8 um, or message me on like, like I would love to know is it is it simply not picking up the uh the the value of that config item is, is that all that's happening um or or is there or is there another error if it's simply not picking that up um i'd actually hmm i need to see it because it works it works fairly standard i don't think there's anything special you need to do for um for for configs there but I'd be interested in that. I don't, I don't know offhand. Um, I don't have anything offhand. Um, should work just fine. If you are passing in let's config, do you have the, are, are you passing in the environment very like the, the M through an environment variable, like in the config, or are you hard coding it in the config? All comes back as undefined. Um, comes back as undefined. That sounds like a, hmm. even though I can console log configs without issue. So you can console log the config without issue. Um, that's weird. That is very weird. I would be interested. Do you, um, any chance you could share? I would be interested in diving into this. Is there any chance you could share that image uh, or the Docker file? Um, if so I, I, you know, in, I'd love to, to try to help. That sounds like a interesting problem. Hmm. Ship shoop. Let's clarify so many areas for me. I'm, I'm glad uh, Docker can be, Docker can be interesting. And I'm hoping that uh, our continued usage of it, like when we actually start doing real things, like we're picking up the basics. Basically the first three classes is picking up the basics, like of like the core concepts. And then we're gonna be like using those concepts for three classes and like doing some cool stuff. So hopefully it'll clear up more and more things as well. I have many keep running and couldn't get to run Docker containers and map to ports. It's running uh, road, over and everything. Yeah, that's fair. Minikube would make it. Uh, Minikube is dope, but um, you know that that networking layer of of Kubernetes is interesting. What's my stream schedule? My stream schedule is Monday through Thursday. Um, for right now, for the next two weeks. So this is the end of this week. The next two weeks, um, it is Mondays and Wednesdays are something called Waddle which is in, uh, as a deep dive into Linux, it's a foundations course in Linux and Tuesdays and Thursdays are this are uh, contained, which is, um, which is this deep dive into Docker. Um, so that's my stream schedule. Uh, my stream schedule will probably stay Monday through Thursday, no matter what, uh, but we do a lot of other stuff. We run some boot camps, uh, some DevOps stuff, cloud computing, uh, software engineering as well, all learning uh soon we'll be adding in a day um where we're building um we're, we're gonna be building a couple open source projects um I'm trying to map it out now container waddles like beer and wings i love it i love it perfect i'll be here tomorrow cool that's, that's dope I, i'd love to take a look at it coming across kubernetes deep dive oh sin city kubernetes deep dive course is on the dot like i've already started working on the kubernetes one um the kubernetes one because uh, because Kubernetes is going to fit in a number of places. It's also going to fit in in pipelines a little bit, uh, but absolutely there will be a Kubernetes uh, extreme deep dive. It'll be it'll be way more 
in depth than this docker course is going to be uh the kubernetes one will probably um cover all this stuff as well it'll probably start with docker but it'll probably do it in a shortened version probably the first two classes will be basically everything we're learning in these six classes um and and before the year's over a kubernetes one will be uh will be out <laughs> Have you worked on the CI CD with Docker containers and cube? Uh, um, not, yes, um, I have not. Yes, I have. Um, I don't know why I don't, in my mind, because you wrote cube, I automatically, because we were talking about mini cube before, I was like, I never done anything with mini cube, but like, yes, if Kubernetes and CI CD, Docker containers, I'm, I, I, I know CI, CI containers and CI pipeline are like, I, I'm, I'm good at those things um but yeah kubernetes is about to be wild because one so i think one of the things is like i'm for sure not an expert in kubernetes um and i'm learning a lot now but i think that's what's gonna make i think that's what's gonna make that course so fun is that um is um i under like i i do a lot of container orchestration um i use kubernetes for a lot i use ecs for a lot i use a number of or container orchestration platforms for a lot of things uh and i think that's going i think i have a i have a lot of use cases for it um and so i think i think i think that's gonna be a really fun course um yeah um do you know what a hybrid cloud is yes a hybrid cloud great question um so hybrid cloud not to be confused with multi-cloud and and a hybrid cloud is you know if you were doing multi-cloud and you were actually using them in tandem I would also consider it to be a hybrid cloud, but hybrid cloud simply means that you are using some services. You have some applications and systems that are on premises. So maybe, you know, maybe in my house, maybe I'm a big company, little company, and maybe I'm running, um, maybe I'm running some things from my house. Maybe I have some HR software. Maybe I have some, um, some storage software. Maybe I'm running, you know, some NASs and maybe I'm running some applications in house here uh and with servers that are in my basement but i supplement those with uh with services and servers that are in the cloud so so part of my system is here on prem um but i'm also utilizing amazon or google and i have servers that i'm utilizing from them where i'm running services and i'm running things uh that interact with my services that are on prem uh and i'm using them both in tandem to get a really good experience um, that's all a hybrid cloud is is some on-prem some things that are on premises and some things that are in a cloud generally they have to uh interact in some way for that to really be considered a hybrid cloud but you know nowadays people call whatever they want a hybrid cloud uh, but some stuff on-prem some stuff in the cloud multi-cloud would be uh this kind of the same thing but i have some stuff in aws i also have some stuff in microsoft azure and i use them in tandem to do some cool stuff or my failover is in another cloud or whatever but hopefully, hopefully that helps a little bit. Um, Azure Docker to you can just Jenkins plugin for Docker and Azure Docker to source control management. Yeah, I don't like. Oh, I gotta. I'm gonna still be. Nope. I said I would stop saying I dislike Jenkins. I would just say that um, Jenkins is not my favorite. That's all. Um, so you don't you don't need any you don't need any plugins if you use Circle or Travis or other things uh you don't need any plugins um but yeah uh, we're gonna we're gonna do one of these there's a so little preview the next uh excursion that's coming up is uh there's gonna be when these two are done there's gonna be a git one there's gonna be one for git um and that one's almost all practical because it you can learn git commands pretty quickly that one's almost all exercises we're gonna be working together people are gonna be hopping into the same code base uh one for git um, and I'm still, I'm still choosing between the other technology and we're probably going to run one more round of excursions before I'm full time and I can get back into the next set of journeys. Um, but yeah, that information will come, but, um, Git will be, Git for sure will be next. And, uh, probably, uh, probably Terraform is probably going to be the one that I do with Git. Uh, to be hundred, yep. But you call it frequency hop. You called it the perfect time, right? Right before you put that out there. Terraform is probably the one that's going to go. Um, there were for a number of reasons. I was going to hold off one more session for Terraform. Um, yeah, we'll see how much time I have. Um, Terraform is is the front runner for what's going to happen uh, next. Uh, but there are a lot. Again, there are a lot of options 
or what will happen next. Um, and also I have, a, I have some ideas for other series as well. Again, I really wanna get around to us building real things. Um, and I wanna wait for people to follow along. I really, really want to scale uh, a people's ability to be able to get genuine experience. Uh, I want I want to work on real pro like I don't want to just be here. Um, I want to set up a paradigm to where companies can understand and say, and say, hey, I see that process that you did. I understand the way that people are are contributing and going through this process. Even if you're not writing the exact code, I think there's a paradigm and process you can set up to where people can where, where you where you can come in and we can work through real projects as if you would do it in the workplace and that experience be very meaningful. Um, and so the, the process around that is a little more important than the actual execution. So I'm really, I'm, I'm trying to work it out. I'm really trying to work it out, but getting Terraform is almost 100% what it'll be. Um, but appreciate that. I appreciate that daily, daily Yarborough, but oh, Dale, Dale Yarborough. Hey, I, uh, I know who you are. Um, I think, I think I know who you are. Also, I appreciate that. Absolutely. But that's it. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Thanks everyone. I, I have swag on the way. I do. I have um I have some t-shirts. Um well the t-shirts aren't ordered yet. Uh they were they were being designed. Um but I have stickers. I do have stickers on the way. I ordered stickers a couple of days ago. Um I finally remembered to order stickers. Uh there will be some other things. Um though it's funny because that's one of the first things that ended up on my list. Uh for everyone who didn't hear, um, I will be going full time and mastermind as a company, uh, not just like mastermind Academy, but I'm spending the next, um, 60 days or so, um, really getting things, you know, shut down at work, uh, really getting things, uh, you know, um, uh, taking care of the things I need to do. Also preparing myself for that time. Uh, so there's a lot going to be happening in that time. Well, by HashiCorp would be cool. Yeah. I, so I, I really want to do almost all the HashiCorp stuff. I even think, I even think vagrant, uh, I think I think almost everything HashiCorp has. I don't know anything about Nomad yet. Uh, it's pretty valuable, but there, you know, there's a million technologies. We're gonna have fun for all of them. Um, Discord, uh, there is a Discord. It's for subs only. Uh, just because I want, like, it, it felt weird to split off the Slack and the Discord. Um, I don't know. I, I I may just put out a poll for you all to see what you like better, and we may just make one of them op completely open. If people seem to like Discord a whole lot, I like Discord too. Um, but, and it gives people a place to, to like talk. Um, and it's cheaper to get a, it's so much cheaper if I want to get like something that keeps version histories and stuff, like more messages, like I don't have to pay per user, which is super nice. So we'll, uh, we'll check that out, but that's it. I do need to go. I need to get some more dinner. I ate like six noodles and I need to eat more noodles because of my bike ride and you know, gotta get my energy back. Um, uh, but who, who are we rating tonight? Any? Body have anyone that you care about? Oh, anyone that you care about that we should hit up? Ah, I like that it's in recommended and not uh, Tej underscore DV. I'm with it. That you you called it out first. I'm just gonna put it in here just to make sure it's not like anyone who's butt naked. You know that matters, and I like it. Uh, it's doing go in the cloud. Alt F4 is always doing go in the cloud. I love Alt F4. I love Alt F4's channel. Uh, people should check out Alt F4 for sure. But let's give some other people some love. We rated Alt F4 a couple times. Uh, yeah, let's let's head over to Teej underscore DV. Let them know we said hello. I will be over there watching. I love Neo. I, you know, I'm I'm getting better and better at Vim every day. Um, I'm a I'm a you know I'm a big Vim user, but I'm not amazing. I I thought I was good until I watched all these amazing people on Twitch be better than me at Vim, and I was like, man, I need to get better. So let's head over, say hello. But thanks everybody for spending some more time. Week one of the excursions is complete. Two more weeks. Get some rest this weekend. You know, spend some time. You know, learning a little bit. Try some stuff out. Feel free. You know, explore the things that you learn. Don't be afraid to hop onto your computer and just. Try some stuff out, you know, have a little fun with it. Um, explore, have a, have a good time. You'll learn a lot in the process as well. Uh, but peace out, everybody have a good weekend.